This is the introductory video for the Projectile Motion Lab. So the projectile motion apparatus mainly consists of this steel tube, and we're going to put a steel ball in here, which will roll down the tube and then be fired horizontally out of the end of the tube. So on your desk you will have this small steel ball, and over here, where you can't see it actually, on this side of the tube there's a hole that this ball fits into. And this latch here is going to act as a trigger. When I lift it up, the ball will be released, it'll roll down the tube, and it'll fire out the opposite end of the tube. So I'll do that now. So I release the ball, and it comes out the opposite end of the tube. Now the purpose of us doing the lab is we want to theoretically predict and experimentally measure the horizontal range that the ball travels, so how far it goes out from the end of the tube horizontally. So you're going to need to take some measurements off the tube itself to theoretically predict how far the ball is going to go, and then you're going to actually do the experiment five times and get an experimental value for the horizontal range of the ball. And then you'll compare those two numbers to see whether they agree with an uncertainty. Now your lab manual tells you to first measure all of the quantities you're going to need to calculate the range of the ball theoretically. So now let me go over the equations you're going to need. Now calculating the horizontal range of the ball at first glance looks really simple. It's just the exit velocity, that is the velocity the ball had as it was leaving the tube, times the time of flight, which is how long the ball was in the air for. Unfortunately, both the exit velocity and the time of flight are fairly complicated expressions. So let me discuss the exit velocity first. So in this expression we've got g, which is the acceleration due to gravity, divided by 0.7, and if you read through the theory section of the lab manual it explains why this is 0.7, and then it's all multiplied by what I call h terms. So there's h1, h2, h1f, and h2f, and what are all of those? Those are all height measurements. So now I'm going to go back to the experimental apparatus to show you what these four height measurements are. So what are the heights h1, h2, h1f, and h2f? h1 is defined as being the distance between where the ball is released and the floor. There is a little pin on the side of the tube here that marks the center of the ball when it's here, ready to be released. So you would measure from this pin to the ground, and that's your h1 value. h2 is defined as being from the center of the ball when it's just leaving the tube to the ground. So again, there is a pin here that marks the center of the ball just as it's leaving the tube, and you would measure from this pin to the ground to get h2. So before you measure these, you first have to level your tube carefully. That means this section of the tube has to be completely level. So to do this, you grab a spirit level, and you stick it on the end of the tube. So it will balance there, not very steadily, but it will balance there, and then you would look straight down and make sure that the bubble is centered between the lines. If it's not, then you're going to have to make an adjustment. This is slightly confusing. There's two screws. There's this one here, and the whole block rests on this screw, this vertical one, and then there's another screw here in the center. This screw here basically just stabilizes everything, so it doesn't do anything other than just keeping this thing from wobbling too much. So to level your tube, you first loosen this up just so you can move that tube but you're actually going to set the leveling of the tube by adjusting the height of this. So you can move this up or down as you need to, to make sure that your tube is totally level. And when it looks like it's completely level to you, when this is adjusted correctly, then you'll tighten this up, but this is just to keep things from wobbling. So once that far end of the tube is level, then you can measure h1 and h2. Now this might be a little hard for you to see, but there's this string attached to the little pins here and at the other end. This is for a plumb bob. So you've got a little plumb bob and you dangle it off of these screws. The plumb bob is only there to make sure that you get your tape measure nice and vertical. So you don't actually take any measurements off of the plumb bob itself, you just use it to make sure that you've got your tape measure nice and straight. The best length for these plumb bobs is that when it's hooked on here, it's just grazing the floor but not actually touching it. So if you need to adjust the length of the plumb bob, you can pull the string to make it longer or shorter. So like that. So you can adjust that loop as you need to to make your plumb bob the right length. So that's H1 and H2. But remember that there were four things we needed to measure. H1, H2, and also something called H1F and H2F. What are those? Well, to measure H1F and H2F, you have to realign the entire tube. 
if we didn't have any friction in the tube, we wouldn't need to measure H1F and H2F. But we are not going to neglect friction in the tube in this experiment. We're going to get a grip on how much of it there is. And to do this, we have to tilt the tube back, like this. So as you can see, I've tilted the track way back at a quite an extreme angle. This is almost all the way down. But this is not a random angle that I've set it to. I've purposefully tilted the track such that when I put the ball in and release it, it goes just to the end of the track and it doesn't fall out. It just comes back. So the ball came right to the end of the track and then it rolled back. It didn't fall out and it did come right to the end. The reason why I set it to that exact angle is that this end of the tube is still higher than that end of the tube by a little bit. So if we take the difference between this height and that height, we can figure out the potential energy difference between them, mgh. And that potential energy difference tells us how much energy was lost in the tube just due to friction. So that's how we figure out how much friction was in the tube, is we tilt the track back to this exact angle where the ball goes all the way to the end but doesn't fall out, comes back, and then that potential energy difference tells us how much friction we lost. So once you've gotten your tube oriented like this to the perfect angle, then you can measure H1F, F for friction, and H2F. So again, H1F is this end of the tube. You measure from the pin to the ground. You will probably need to readjust your plumb bob lengths. And H2F is again from this pin to the ground. So once you get those measured, you can then re-level the far end of the tube in preparation for data taking. I will warn you that although I made this look really fast and easy to do via video trickery, usually it takes about five minutes to get your tube adjusted correctly to get H1F and H2F, just because you'll have to orient it back and forth until you get it right to the perfect angle where the ball goes right to the end but doesn't fall out. So now let's talk about the time of flight. Calculating the time of flight depends on the fact that it doesn't matter whether you horizontally project the ball out of the tube or drop it straight down, it'll be in the air for the same amount of time. So the vertical and horizontal components of the velocity don't affect one another. This expression calculates the time of flight by calculating how long the ball would take to drop straight down. So this expression in the brackets is how far the ball drops vertically. There's only two measured quantities here. One of them is h2, which you've already measured, that's just the height of the pin to the ground at the exit end of the tube. And the other quantity is r, which is the radius of the steel ball. So you would take your digital calipers, measure the diameter of the steel ball, and then divide by two to get this radius. So what are calipers? On your desk, you should have a box like this, and inside you'll find your digital calipers. The way in which you use these is you press the jaws together and you click on. And it's important that you do have the jaws pressed together when you push on because that zeroes the scale. So in order to get accurate values, you do have to zero it while the jaws are together, like that. So you zero it and you make sure that you're on the millimeter scale. If you're not, this button up here will change between the two. So just make sure you're on the metric scale. To take a measurement, you clamp the object between the jaws and read your value directly off the calipers. It's most accurate to leave the object clamped in the jaws when you take the measurement, just because if you take the object out, you can't be totally sure that you haven't accidentally adjusted the position of the jaws. The apparatus section of your lab manual tells you what the instrument uncertainty of the digital calipers is, and when you're done using it, you, you turn it off with this button. Here's a closer view of the launch end of the tube, which I've leveled for data taking purposes. And the purpose of this experiment, as I've said, is to measure the range of the ball, so how far it goes from the end of the tube horizontally. So the way in which we're going to do that is we're going to do a trial run to see where the ball lands, and then we'll stick a piece of carbon paper down on the floor there in such a way that we can flip back the carbon paper and see the dot on the page that the ball makes when it hits the ground. So I'm going to do that now. So now you're ready to take data. So you would fire the ball onto the paper five times, and then you would measure the range, which would be from the bottom of your plumb bob over to the dot on the page. 
Because you're going to do this five times, you're going to have five ranges, and you'll actually use the largest one as your official measured range value. However, it's possible that not all the dots on your page are going to be in the same location. In other words, they may be scattered around on the page a little bit because there is a little bit of wobble to this tube even when we tighten it down. So if the ball hits the same point on the page every single time, then your uncertainty is probably going to be set by the size of the dot on the page. However, if your dots are scattered around, then you should probably take that scatter into account when you choose the size of your uncertainty. Now before I sum up, I want to explain something from the time of flight calculation. So in that calculation, when you're calculating how long the ball is in the air for, the distance involved is h2 minus r, where r is the radius of the ball. So why is that? Remember that h2 is defined as being from this pin to the ground. So why do we subtract off the radius of the ball? Well, that's because the center of mass of the ball is not what hits the ground. The edge of the ball is. So in order to get the distance that the center of mass of the ball actually dropped, it is going to be h2 minus 1 radius of the ball, because that's how far above the floor the center of mass of the ball is when it strikes the floor. So, in summary, you're going to start this experiment by calculating the theoretical range that the ball goes horizontally when it's projected from the tube. In order to get that theoretical range, you're going to need to measure h1, h2, h1f, h2f, and also the radius of the ball. Once you've got your theoretical value, then you're going to get a measured value by firing the ball five times onto a piece of carbon paper. And then you peel back the carbon paper and measure the distance from the end of the plumb bob over to the dots on the page. And finally, you'll take your longest measured range and compare it to your theoretical value for the range and see whether they agree with an uncertainty.